We have previously discussed how even the mainstream sees stars forming along filaments. We know from EU theory that these stars are born in the pinches of these filaments. We also suspect that these stars will tend to move away from the highest current density areas as they settle down to become a more normal star. I have often wondered what mechanism would cause this. When we look at our solar system we suspect that all the gas giants are captured brown dwarfs. And I wondered by what mechanism could a star be ejected from a filament. Walt Thornhill then kindly sent over to me this mainstream paper which could potentially hold the key to explaining both of these. Let's explore. Filament structures have been identified in the interstellar medium for well over a century. What is most remarkable about these structures is that they have an undulating form and a very uniform width. Nowadays the mainstream explanation is related to magnetic fields and gravitational potential energy. Many cosmological simulations have demonstrated that gravity alone can produce these types of filament structures. But these never have the twisting and turning structures observed in the actual filaments, so gravity alone cannot explain their structure of creation. More interesting is that these filaments seem to contain what is considered protostars. Astronomers consider these to be stars that have recently formed. When we examine the Orion A filament, we now know it is enveloped in a helical magnetic field, and these help to explain the filament structures. These types of magnetic fields are generated primarily by currents moving along the filaments, and the continuous flow helps maintain the filament structure. These observations by Helios of the Orion Nebula constitute a smoking gun and polarization measurements by Matthews and Wilson provide information in a second dimension that confirms this picture. Now this should come as no surprise to you. Filaments that have a current, a magnetic field, and contain newly forming stars is exactly what the electric universe postulates. One question that I have often asked is how can a star's output be affected over its lifetime? Is it possible that a star could wander from the center of the filament? Could it even be possible that stars can be ejected out of this filament altogether? In a paper by Amelia Stutz and Andrew Gould, they address exactly these questions by studying the Orion A cloud filaments. They examined the filament in the Orion A cloud and found the following key features. The protostars almost all sit on narrow gas column ridges, while the stars are either more broadly distributed near the ridges or are displaced from the ridges altogether. The gas, protostars and stars all have highest density along the integral shaped filament. There is a strong knot of stars NGC 1977 just north of the integral shaped filament, which is almost devoid of gas and which they dubbed as the orphan cluster. And lastly there is a tenuous gas filament extending west and to the northwest from the northern tip of the integral shaped filament. They discovered that there are essentially no stars that sit directly on the gas column ridges. This, they reason, means that rather than the stars collapse and use up all of the surrounding gas to form the star, ending this phase of their development. Since the stars they do observe once used to be protostars, they had to previously be in this filament. This would only be possible if either the stars or the filaments have accelerated between the protostar phase and their present position. If the gas was not accelerating, there would be no way to accelerate the stars, since the line of density of protostars and space density of stars are at least an order of magnitude too low to induce transverse motion of the required amplitude. This means that the only possibility is that the filament itself is undergoing this acceleration. The orphan cluster lying just north must have formed out of the filamentary cloud, just like the other stars. The overall picture is of repeated episodes of star cluster formation, each triggered by a transverse wave that propagates northwards through the filament. Each episode ends in a violent contraction of the filament at its northern end, which both ignites an episode of star formation and then disperses the loose end of the filament that formerly connected Orion A and Orion B. By examining the relative velocities of the population of stars, they were able to confirm this concept and saw that protostars had substantially lower specific kinetic energy compared to nascent stars, which have received a substantial kick somewhere in their journey from protostellar to stellar phase. 
They argue that the slingshot arises specifically because the magnetic fields in this region are subcritical, leading to instabilities of two types. The first on the scale of the filament as a whole. There are global instabilities that result in a transverse wave. The second is where there are local pinching instabilities that generate repeated episodes of rapid star formation. Protostars form along the filaments and are initially accelerated transversely with the filament as it undergoes transverse oscillations. This continues as long as the protostars remain below a certain mass. Eventually the mass of the protostar grows and becomes too great and its inertia will prevent the protostar from following the movement of the filament. At this point they continue to move with whatever transverse velocity the filament had at the time of decoupling while the filament continues to oscillate. They also think that the instabilities that cause the formation of the wave is long-lived and would exist for many episodes of star formation. Further south from this is L1641, which shares the same large-scale potential as this filament, but does not exhibit transverse wave morphology, and it is not forming stars at a rapid rate. In their view, L1641 therefore represents a first stage of star formation. Characterized by straight, magnetically supercritical filaments with low star formation rates. This filament represents a second stage, characterized by higher star formation rates and driven by magnetic instabilities that give rise to the transverse waves. Now there are a number of aspects that are important to consider from this paper. The first is the obvious fact that this mainstream article is referring to currents that move along this filament which causes the pinching instabilities along it. Second, they see this as a mechanism to bring the gas together to cause star formation rather than simply through gravitational collapse. Third, that this filament is actually not stationary but is moving and it is this motion that causes the eventual ejection of the newly formed stars. Now they do see that this is a short-lived process whereby the gas is eventually used up rather than the idea that these filaments might actually connect to other larger structures. It is important to realise that what they do see is a significant increase in the density of the filament towards the centre falling off as you move away from the centre. If we examine the filament we see that it would appear to be highly active with large parts of the most active regions clearly visible and in glow mode. Further to the south, it is not hard to see the continuation of the filament with stars located near the central spine but some distance away. This paper does raise some interesting questions about how stars are formed. In the electric universe, they are caused by pinching instabilities in the filament, which is exactly what we are seeing here. This would appear to paint a picture that newly forming filaments or perhaps only the central part of a very active filament can initiate these instabilities through the length or part of it, forming new stars, and that this process of instability also causes the movement of this filament, leading to the eventual ejection out of the central part of the filament. There seems to be a critical mass that a star must reach before the ejection process occurs. This may mean that these newly created stars living at the heart of a pinch are in fact very rare and most stars are therefore always offset from this central axis. This may well explain why the stars would appear to undergo changes in their appearance. As they move further from the center of the filament, the current density would continue to drop, causing changes to the size and the color of the stars. This may even explain how stars could be ejected entirely from the filament and subsequently captured by other systems and they may even explain the curious case of the disappearing stars I covered last year. One important distinction to make is that in the mainstream model this filament is a medium term event. As stars form they use up this plasma until nothing is left in the filament. In the electric universe these filaments are structures that connect all parts of the galaxy together, just like a root system. This means that this filament is experiencing a much higher load than normal. This results in the formation of pinches along this filament forming new stars. Some local conditions might also be responsible for causing this to occur. One question this raises is if this is a rare event that generally only occurs when filaments do not have many stars within them. Do existing stars provide enough of a load to allow the energy 
of such an increase to be dissipated in a different way? Or could this occur in a more populated filament at any time? One other question to consider is that of the overall size of the filament. Is what we see in this image just the central part of the filament? And where the stars end up being ejected to, is this still very much part of the overall filament structure just further from the central axis, where the highest current densities would exist? When we look at Don Scott's model, this is what we would expect to see. A related question to this is whether this pinching effect and the formation of stars is always accompanied by this wandering of the filament. Is it possible to get pinches forming along a filament without the wandering? In this example, we are dealing with many pinches forming along the filament. Is the movement of the filament something that only happens when the current density is high enough to create these types of instabilities? Or is it something that scales with current density? So in essence, it will always move a small amount, but only with larger current densities could it be enough to eject stars. What effect would this have on the existing stars within the filament? If we look at what we speculate is the configuration of our filament wrapped around Arcturus, can we imagine that all of these stars, including our own, was created in a pinching effect along the central axis of the Arcturus stream? Initially, as the current density was very high, the stars were ejected outwards and would end up moving out towards the first shell, which would have more of an azimuthal component, causing them to start moving around the central axis. As the current density starts to fall, the movement of the filament reduces enough to stop the ejection process, leaving what appears as a stream of stars with a lower current density, exactly like the Arctura stream. There is much to digest here and many questions that this raises. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.